So great. We have these basic systems put together. Let's start looking at really how we now can you know just sort of see are they working together? What's really happening in terms of uh, trying to keep them coordinated? And let's show you how you can do that. If I pop out to like a 3D view, for example, you can sort of see my mechanical systems hanging around in here. See if you can get to that. And I'm going to really show you two ways of looking for conflicts. The first one is actually just working within Revit, which is nice, because if you're also kind of working with other people working in Revit, you can just sort of do things very, very quickly. Um, the limitation is it's sort of within Revit. So if you have people who are working in AutoCAD or in some other sort of drafting system to bring things together. Now, you can't do it within Revit. We have to go out to this other tool, Navisworks, to do it. But within Revit, we can already start to sort of look for some conflicts. Now, this project's pretty small, so I could probably even sort of sp you could probably even spot with your eye where some of the problems are just looking at it right now. But if uh, this project were a little bit bigger and we were all in the same office, you know, some of these things may hide from you. Okay, and it's helpful to have a way to go through and programmatically look for them because uh, we don't always see the, the, the skeleton of the building where it makes it so obvious where the problems are. And how we sort of look at this is under the Collaborate tab, go pop it over there, you'll find something right next to Copy Monitor called Interference Checking. And Interference Checking is really, it's just looking for spatial interferences. It's, there's no smarts behind it in terms of anything about whether the system's working and whether you've done a good job of designing it. It's really just spatially, are you overlapping me? Okay? And if you run Interference Checking, we can say run an Interference Check and let's take a look at what you can do. The idea is you really have two different things you want to check, sort of the left side and the right side. And within this, oh, on the current project, let's just start right with that right now. We'll just look at sort of everything that's in this MEP project. You can go ahead and choose the categories of things that you want to try intersecting with each other and see if there's interferences. Now these categories, these are the same categories like that show up in visibility graphics. Everything has a category. So as we've been placing things, some things are ducts, some things are air terminals, some things are sprinklers, some things are walls. Okay? And you can check anything you want to in here. As you go through and do this, it's much smarter that, you know, to smudge, what, look at specific items and focus on types of interferences you're looking for and look for them in small ways as opposed to just saying, intersect this whole model with that whole model. Because just the way we model things, um, you know, if you just say intersect a whole model with another one, there could be thousands of them, and you'll spend all your time just kind of trying to sort out what are the goods and the bads, and because some things touch each other or overlap each other because of the way we model them, but it's okay. Yeah, but if you're looking for specific problems, for example, I could say let's go ahead and just take a look at the issue of the ductwork on this side, and let me take a look at the issue of the pipes on this side and see if we have any duct pipe interferences with each other. Okay, so just keep it pretty simple. If I want to include the flexi ducts also, I could kind of put that over on that side too. Okay, but it's I'm going to compare things in category A to category B. Okay, if I chose ducts versus ducts, I could be looking for just you know are any ducts sort of doing something weird that like overlapping each other in a way that's not a valid connection. But let me look at ducts and flexi ducts versus pipes. And if I say okay to that, okay, we actually have some problems here. Okay, So we see that for some ducts, there's some interference problems with some pipes. Each of these different things is considered an issue, something that needs to be resolved. So let's open them up and take a look at them one at a time. Underneath this listing of this one issue in the report, we see there's some sort of duct over here. It actually has a specific ID. That's a Every item in the database has an ID to it. So it's the specific mark or the ID to it. There's um, the mark for the pipe that we're having a problem with. If you want to actually see where those are, what you can do is actually just click on that, and it will highlight that duct. And if I click on the pipe, it will show me the pipe. Okay, so I got a problem there. In the same sense, I can look at this one and see that it's conflicting with that. Again, over here, I'm going to look at this one and see that it's conflicting with that pipe. So pretty quickly, you're going to start getting the sense that, oh, hmm, 
I seem to have a problem with uh, my sprinkler system and my ductwork. Everything's running at the same level, so I've got to do something about that in terms of trying to fix that. So we can do that, and the idea is you're really you're right here in Revit, so you can try to fix that. For example, if I zoom on in and see that's where it's all happening, I could say, OK, let me just kind of close up that report for now. Let's take a look at that pipe and see if we can do anything to it. If I, for example, chose that pipe, see if I can get to it. Oh, there it is. I thought I was going to get to it. Let me do it over the flan view. That might be easier. Uh, level two, up there. Actually, if you want to, let me show you the interference report again. You can show it in a different view, too. It really will work on tarp in top of any view. I'll just show the last report since we already have some things selected. I'm saying it's showing it to me. OK, and there's where the problem is. Let's go to another one. There's a piece of ductwork, which is back there, and some pipe that's running into it. OK. So we have some problem, really, with our sprinkler piping in terms of what's going on. Let's see if we can go ahead and fix that. If I took all my sprinkler piping and I could select them individually or I could just select it as a batch, really, depending on where we're thinking we're having the problems. In fact, if I'm going against the ductwork, it looks like, what, let's find the ones that have a problem. This one has a problem. Any of the ones that go cutting across there have a problem. So I could either choose them individually or let me just go grab a whole bunch of them. I'm just going to grab them and I'm going to filter, saying all I really want to get now are the pipes. And let's try changing their element properties. So as opposed to being at, it looks like they might have an uneven offset right now. That's interesting. Let me try adjusting a few independently. Then we can think about adjusting them all. Let's see if we can fix these ones that are right here. I bet those, since they're all the main run there, have the same height for them. Not letting me do that. <coughs> Filter that. What are you doing? Select. I'm control clicking. As soon as I get that last one, it gets the whole system. I don't want that. Well, we do a couple. Keep on trying to do things uh, in batches. Oh, well, there we have the offset right now. It's even showing it right there. If those things are interfering, but they're just interfering a little. I can decide what I'd like to sort of bring those pipes down or would like to bring them up a little bit. Let me try bringing them up to uh, like 11 foot 6. Okay, it'll pop them on up. The nice thing is the system's actually pretty smart about what it does. Okay, so you can see we've raised those pipes up. Looks like it actually raised up the whole main riser there in terms of what's going on. Not sure if you can see right now. See that pipe, that main line's really going the whole way. In fact, I think it may have raised the whole system up because it tries to be pretty smart about what it's doing. Let's try running that interference check again. We'll show the last report. Let me refresh it. Okay, and it looks like that one simple change actually took care of it all. I just sort of, I raised that main like uh, line for the sprinklers up and they all went away. Do it again? What? <laughs> Actually, in this case, I think it was smart enough just based on the one. It sort of figured that if that one had to go, we'll take them all. But let's try it again and sort of see if I can get it. Having a hard time selecting it. That's just the architectural model. Let me go back to the floor plan again. So ceiling plan, looking up at it. Let's just try choosing that one. Change it up to like 11 foot. What did I make it, 11 foot 8? OK, then we'll look back at it in 3D. And it looks like it's actually raising the whole system. Okay, 
If we started playing around with the, some of the branches or something like that, we might be able to go ahead and kind of change it individually. Like for example, well, I won't mess with that right now. It'll break. <laughs> so let's go ahead and do it that way. You can say you can run the interference check. So we can look at ducts versus piping, for example, and see how that's going. Now, ducts versus piping is a good thing to look at. Another thing you might want to look at that's a more common problem, although no, ducts and piping is pretty good. That's a very common one. Okay. Oh, and let's even stop and think about that. There really is a hierarchy to this. If you think about really, you know, oh, what's easiest to move and what's hardest to move as you go through and approach this stuff. Okay. In the scheme, if you were looking at it just in terms of what's easy versus what's hard to move, I might approach it like this. In the scheme, I think one of the easiest things to move is electrical. Because electrical is actually, short of moving the fixtures, just moving the wiring around someone else is really, really easy. It's quite simple to kind of move conduits around and stuff like that. So if I was prioritizing, I'd put sort of electrical at the tail end of this. Okay, Then above that, I think piping tends to win out over electrical. And then above that, I think the duct work <laughs> tends to win out. And finally, structural. So what do I mean by here? If I had to go through and move things around, yeah. If I can solve the problem by moving the piping as opposed to moving the beams, I should probably move the pipes. That's probably an easier way to do it. Yeah. If it's a choice between ductwork and piping, again, I'd probably try moving the pipes before I try rerouting the ductwork, something like that. But again, this is strictly subjective and just based on my own intuition about how to do it. Yeah, you might have another system that sort of like changes your priority in terms of how these things are going. But yeah, there's s some things are harder or more impactful to move. Other things are relatively easy and local to move. So, you know, kind of think of it. There really is an order to it and how you might approach it. Yes? Are you tying up the structural elements to the like, structural features? Like when MC uh, built the four pies, or sometimes you have to change the. Oh, certainly. In fact, a very, very valid thing. The architect will give you, oh, I want a 10 foot floor to floor height. And then by the time you sort of put in the structure and everything that needs to be there, yeah, there may not be enough room. Yeah, and that's a very common sort of conflict and a problem to deal with. Yeah, and often the answer is that the architecture should change. You know, in fact, a very common thing you'll find for you when you're doing your structural engineering is architects will put columns in sort of these places that they think sort of look good architecturally, but may lead to a sort of a very inefficient structure. So this whole notion of you having to come back and say that, you know, really for my needs, these sorts of column lines make sense in terms of aligning things because they'll have good spacings and this will align me nicely with how I'm sort of planning on taking the lateral forces down. And I really do need some sort of shear core to take this on. You know, it's very, you know, that should be a discussion. You know, so although this sort of is sort of a hierarchy of how I think it's easy to fix, it's by, not all, by no means that you know, the architect rules and everyone just has to fall in the line beyond that. Because it really, it needs to be a discussion. And on projects where people are being inflexible and driving without considering the impact of the structural engineering, those are the ones that get into trouble. Yeah, I think really the best structures, if I, if I go through every building that I really love, the best buildings are the ones where actually the structure is, you know, it's an integral part. It actually featured in the architecture, as opposed to sort of being something that's hidden behind the walls. Because that's just my bias. I love structure, and I like being able to see it. And I think that the most interesting forms are the ones that are really expressive of it. But that, that's just me. Everyone has a different bias. So you now it's. Uh, yeah, the structure and the architecture sort of need to work together, and often the architecture has to push back. So if in your model, for example, if in your model you want to go through and put the columns in such a way that's putting a column right in the middle of one of my windows, that's OK. We just need to have a discussion about it. Because it's not necessarily true that you know my window, you know, I might have some flexibility about moving those windows and things like that. Or if I have a solid wall of glass and there's absolutely no room to put any sort of structural bracing in there, or I'm going to have to keep it exposed or something. Again, that's a discussion we need to have. Yeah, it's really you have requirements, and there's nothing to say that my solid wall of glass needs to be there. I, you know, it should be a discussion. Okay, so this is the whole notion of really just intersecting as we go within a single model. So even in a single model, and you'll find this is even true in your architectural models or like any models you work with. Yeah, you could have just conflicts in your own model. That just happens. Okay. But let's go ahead and go one step further. Let's even still within Revit say, let's compare what's going on with this MEP model to the structural model. 
and kind of see if those two are adding up relative to each other. And again, we can do this in Revit as long as we do it pairwise. Okay, we can't go any further. So to do that, I can look at it a couple different ways. There's this whole notion of linking models together. And we've been taking the architectural model and linking it into the structural model and linking it into the MEP model, but I can actually link them back. Okay, and that's A-OK. -okay. Ultimately, you want to link them all back together to make sure that things work from both sides. To do that, well, let me do this. I'm going to go over to my structural model, hanging over here, and we're going to link that architectural or the uh, MEP model back to this. Doesn't really matter. You could do it the other way. You could link the structural model into the MEP, the same result. It just sort of depends on which one you're going to have the flexibility to change. Because if I'm in the MEP model, I'll be changing MEP elements. If I'm in the structural model, I can change the structural elements. But because uh, the linked models I can always see, but I can't touch. So well, actually, may I make it easy on you? I'll stay in the MEP and do it that way. We can say that we want to, in fact, let me see if it's even linked so far. I think it may be already in here. Actually, I do have the structural model linked in. Let me take it out just so you can sort of see what that looks like. So I can show you how you would do this on your own. OK, so if you have the MEP model, it's kind of hanging around over here, and you want to cross-link in the structural model, <coughs> what you do is you say under Insert, you'll link it to a Revit model. And you go out and grab that structural model. And let me go out to Stanford. And 110, 16. And again, you can find this on the L drive if you want to. Okay. As you go zip on, on through here, one very important thing to do is not to just click on auto center to center, because that'll get you in trouble. Remember to take that like <coughs> that one last step, which says origin to origin. Because if you do center for center, it just sort of it'll throw things off. It gives you the, just the trouble. Yes. Um, if your origins are different, yes. Um, in the tree, is there a way to like change the origin? There is. There is. And let me address this first. What's happening here is this is saying, oh, there's a nested link that won't appear. What's happening is the structure mo or the uh, structure model refers to the architecture model. So it's basically telling us it won't also bring in the architecture model, the nested put. It, it's going to leave out for now. And the reason is you can actually get these funny circular loops if we start getting in the second and third hand nesting. OK, so that's what this is telling you. Let's see if it's actually in there now. And then we'll go that again. Manage links. Yep, it's in there now. OK, beautiful. Um, ask a question again. It's just slipped right out of my mind. So, OK, so like, let's say the origins are yes. somehow different. Like, can you make things relative to like one object? Or you can. And let's talk about how you do that, although it's, it's boy. This, this will get me down a whole other path. Yeah. So, some people know this problem from last year. OK, and let me see if I can find it where it is. Oh, l listen to her laugh wickedly. She <laughs> it's like hours and hours of my life wasted. It, it takes a long time to do this sometime. But it basically gets to this whole issue of you got to figure out like which project's going to be the dominant project. OK, it actually has the unit that you want to keep. And what we're going to do is publish the coordinates from one project and acquire them into another project. Okay, and I'm not going to do it now because it really is kind of a big old mess. And the specific steps, yeah, I won't remember. And Rian won't either. It's just really, <laughs> it's, uh, it's hard. It, it can't, let's say this, it can be fixed, but if you can avoid it, <laughs> like by just doing the auto, uh, the, center, the origin to origin, do that. But you know, it can be fixed. And if you have a, prob a, a broken file and you need help fixing it, come on by and we'll do it. But it's like, it's one of those things, oh, I've got to write this down next time. Because it really was. We spent a long time trying to like, figure out the precise sequence of how to get it all together. Because it, it really was like five steps that had to be executed in perfect order. It didn't work. And, and why didn't we write that down? I think I have it in the email somewhere. <laughs> Send that to me, okay. and we'll post it somewhere. Because actually, yeah, that, that's a good answer to post. <laughs> that would be good. OK, no, exactly. Yeah, I remember writing it one day. OK, so what we've done is we've brought in sort of the structural model. You can't really see the structural model right now. Let me go ahead and uh, just turn this on to uh, wireframe view. Maybe we can see it there. Okay. 
little harder to see right now, but let's see if you can actually uh, see that structural model kind of grayed in. There are actually the columns and the beams right here. The elements over here, which are in our primary model, are kind of showing up darker. But we can now go through and intersect things across sort of the, the beams in these things, too. So let me show you what that would look like. So if we go through and we again go to collaborate, and we say that we want to do an interference check, as opposed to saying from the current project, I can sort of compare things in two different projects. So since I've linked in the structural model, I can sort of compare against the column, the categories in the structural model. If I wanted to compare against the things in the uh, architectural model, if I want to see if, oh, my ductwork is somehow interfering with a door or a window or some ceiling plane or something like that, I could do that too. But let me go ahead and just compare it against the uh, structural framing, because that's probably the most common problem we run into all the time. So I'm just going to go through and compare the ductwork to the structural framing. Okay. I could compare the piping to the structural framing too, but I'll focus on this one issue at first. We'll say OK. And again, I'll get some sort of report here that basically lists just how the ducts work against the structural framing. The other way is I could do it so dominant structural framing, show me how the ducts are, just whichever way you want to. It's just sort of organizing it differently. But if I choose this the same sort of way, if I take a look at a duct, that duct is interfering with some sort of, and it's hard to see because it's so grayed out. It's right behind it there. Let me see if I can come up with a better view to see it. It's, hmm, there's a beam kind of right in here. And the only problem is that it's sort of grayed out, so you're not seeing it very well. Let's see if we can come up with a different view. I don't like it. That's a piece of duct work. I'm just trying to find one that'll sort of uh, be closer to the surface. Nope. Let's try switching over just a different view and see if we can see it a little better. Hmm? Oh, let's do it. It's going to try and find a view where it'll show it better, which is actually a good thing to do. And if you keep on clicking show, it'll rotate through different views until we can try to find one that shows it. Let me go to level one HVAC. Let me just go to that view for a second. Actually, there you can almost sort of see it. It's still sort of grayed out. But there it is. That's the beam, and there's the duct in terms of what's going on. Okay. And now we have this sort of issue that these two things are conflicting. This is going to be a harder one to solve, though, because relative to these beams, which are 24 inches deep, and this piece of ductwork over here, which is running at a specific height, you know, we might have a real problem. In fact, let me go ahead and see if we can get to another view that'll show it a little bit more clearly. And that is, let's go to, oh, just the floor plan view. Let's put a camera in there, because there's nothing that says we can't use any of the standard techniques that we have for visualizing. Put a camera in the space. So now let's see if we can sort of figure out where some of these things are. OK, there is some sort of duct which is interfering with, it's actually that beam right back there in the corner, something like that. Is really interfering with another one. Ah, there we have one where there's the beam right there. Let's see if we can find where the duct is. Might have to look around a little bit to see it. Oh, there's the duct, and there's the beam behind it. OK, so we have a conflict that's really, it's right here where somehow that duct work is conflicting with that beam. So in terms of trying to resolve that, let's think about what we could even do there. Let me uh, push that off to the side. 
I'll try shading that, see if that does any better. So it's this one right here. I'm not sure really what the issue is right there. Hang on. Pop this over. So it's interfering with the beam right there. If we look at this, it probably has to do with sort of the height of the duct versus the beam back in there. So we're going to have to go ahead and adjust one of those. And this is going to be one of those cases where we're just going to have to, uh, based on like the characteristics of both of the different things, just really, uh, you know, what is it, uh, you know, make a decision about what we're going to change. Actually, to really resolve this, just to kind of give you that complete picture about how we might do that, let me go to the MEP thing again and let's put a section in there because a section view might be the best way to actually see what's going on. So if I say again in level one, and I linked it in here. No, I was over at MEP, wasn't I? Yes. OK, back over here. Let me close that up. I confuse myself about where I am right now. OK, we'll do that. We'll go over to uh, level one. We'll say that over here we want to uh, put a section in. Let's go to that section view. I might have to turn up the resolution or turn to a higher level of detail to see things. And I can shade those too. So I can start looking for what's going on. And I think over here it's going to be a little bit clearer. I got a piece of ductwork. That's a sprinkler head back in there. Am I showing the structure? I don't think I'm showing the structure right now in this one. Well, it looks like I am. Oh, let me change to a different view, a uh, different set of view properties. Make it a coordination view, which will show me everything. Oh, and now we got a. Ooh, there we go. That's pretty clear in terms of what's going on. So I got an issue where this ductwork is running squarely right through the middle of that beam over there. So I got something I got to take care of. And this is one of those things where we actually have a big pushback because you know, it may be impossible for me to get the ductwork over there. I may have to come up with a whole different system if I'm going to use this sort of structural system. So I have lots of things available to start thinking about. Do I want to increase the floor to floor height to let them run past each other? Do I want to go with a one-way system as opposed to a two-way beam system to sort of allow some channels to kind of go in that different direction? Or maybe even switch to a different structural system where I have some open joints or you know, maybe I, my structural system have to leave a gap in it somewhere so the ductwork can kind of get around to the next bay for where it needs to be. You know, so I could address it on the structural side or I could get to the whole thing with the ductwork. Maybe the ductwork has to run low and be an exposed system. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways we could approach this. But this is the beginning of a really interesting conversation between the architect, the structural engineer, and the mechanical engineer about how to solve this. Because somehow, you know, those three things just don't add up together the way we've all divide, designed them independently. Okay, so, you know, and that's really what it's all about, is having that discussion. Because, again, the, the tools won't tell you what the answer is. The tools are just going to point out where the problem is. And you, as the experts, have to kind of figure out what you're going to do about it. Okay, now. You'd have to go back in structure. We'd have to go ahead and do something in the structural program, whether it's like leave some sort of an opening in the beam or just reroute it. We'd have to do something over there. It, they, they won't just trim against each other. Yeah. Now, nice try. <laughs> yeah. Although, which you'll which you'll sometimes even see. What's that? Yeah, now that'd be another valid way to do it. Let's say that even here, let's see if we can try to like uh, implement something like that. And again, it'll get me in trouble just because we haven't played with it. But let's see if we can try it. So yeah, let's take your ductwork here, just kind of the way you want to. And oh, let's try to modify and see if I can come up with a nice split on it. So let me split it kind of in the center here somewhere. Okay, now it's two pieces of ductwork. And let me pull that one away. Okay, 
OK, big gap between them. Let's try taking a piece of ductwork now, which is as opposed to 9 by 9 or something like that. Oh, I'm going to make it like you know 12 inches by 3 inches or something like that. And again, this is not an efficient design, but we're just sort of playing to see if this would work. So let me see if I can route that from here to here. Okay, it put the kind of right reducer in there, the whole thing in terms of what's going on there. That looks pretty good. Let's go back to where was I looking at that in a section view? So I've kind of reduced it right in there. So you could try something like that. The, the more common way that people tend to do that is as opposed to sort of having it jump right in the middle there. Uh, where did I put my section view? It was over here somewhere. Oh, it's a coordination drawing. That's where it is. Okay. So, you know, that would kind of work in its own funny thing if we try to get it at the neutral axis, axis yeah. or something like that. Yeah. A more common way a lot of people do this is you'll, have you ever been to a building where you see like a big bump? It's like a big U shaped thing that's wrapping around there. And that's what's going on. It's just basically they ran into a beam and they had to get around it somehow. Oh, and just so you know, in terms of as a principle with running the ductwork, every time you put a bend in there, every 90 degree bend is a huge loss in efficiency. <laughs> okay, so we don't like to put a lot of bends in there to get around beams because it really, you know, then to supply the same air with the same efficiency, we need a much bigger air handler and we're probably going to have much bigger energy costs over the life of the building for doing it that way. So this is really kind of a complex discussion because it's not just the construction cost and who's going to have to do the rework to figure this out. But it's sort of this can affect the whole life cycle performance of the building. And you know, does the designer care about that as much as the owner cares about that as the operator? You know, there's a lot of interesting like trade-off in here. Okay, but again, just tools to give you stuff to sort of play with. Yes? Um, in the case of pipes, uh, sometimes you will allow a pipe to, to, yes, a to penetrate. Yes. It's it, it, how do you tell the problem that that uh, interaction is allowed? That I actually got to look at, actually. Luis, do you know much about that in terms of sort of putting in like it's really an, an insert or like a, a collar to kind of let a pipe pass through a beam or something like that? Is it built into the program right now? I, I don't know. I don't but g give me a buy on that one for now. I'll figure out the right way to do that. Because no, that's a very common thing is that we leave channels yeah, and inserts. And there, that has to be in here somehow because it's that thing. You, you need to put that in the structural drawing so that we leave the insert in there and then hope that it all matches up. Okay, Another sort of kind of variation on this whole theme, though, is that this sort of gets to this whole issue of uh, that you'll talk about upstairs of prefabrication, where prefabrication starts to make sense in that. If we start having complex relationships between the sprinklers and the ductwork and some weird assembly that has to go across here, rather than coming up with something that we're going to fabricate out in the field and take a lot of time there, it may make sense to actually make up a prefabricated component where like all the complexity is sort of reduced to something that's just going to be put into place, point A, point B, and like all that <coughs> yeah, complication is taken care of off-site. So that's another way to approach all this is very often we're, we're getting into this thing that because it's so complex to get them all together, it may be more efficient to actually manufacture sections of all the different systems put together, the plumbing, the sprinklers, and the ductwork, and just bring those as units in sight to go ahead and put them out there because you know, one thing we don't like, and it's sort of a very common thing, is that as the trades kind of move through, there's a sort of this tradition of abusing sort of the space that you have available to kind of make it easy for you to do your own work. So even though you go through and on all the detailed plans show that there's going to be like an incredibly complex way of routing to make this happen, the person who comes in and puts in the ductwork may pay no attention to it, which then leads to a whole separate set of problems in terms of how your contract was set up and which you can really hold them to. Because there was even, in fact, I'll, I'll let you know about this, because it was sort of one of those interesting things that happened last year in the world of BIM. There was a legal case where a very forthright team of designers, you know, they were forward thinking, they headed ahead, they did an incredibly complex sort of mapping of things and worked it out perfectly about how it was all going to fit together. And what they designed could fit together. But when the contractor put it all together out in the field, they didn't put it together that way. So there were big conflicts and clashes, and things didn't work right. Okay, So what got to the courts ultimately was this funny notion that if you as a designer plan it all out in all your 3D modeling, okay, 
you know, but it's not fully spec'd out kind of in the contract documents in terms of what's required, you know, really is the contractor responsible for putting it together the way that you envisioned it having working in your 3D model? Or do they really have the flexibility to do it the way they want to? And what happened in the whole funny thing in the <coughs> end was that because the contract structures really weren't in place and it was sort of a big confusing issue, what ultimately happened is the whole thing got settled really on the side of the contractor in this way because, you know, the, or not got settled out of course, I should say it that way. It got settled such that really the insurance company for the owner just ended up paying the contractor a large chunk of money to make the problem go away. Because this whole issue of really the complexity of layering everything all together and who's really responsible for the layering was such a complex thing and so messy, they figured that like uh, no jury was ever going to like come up with a reasonable answer to all this. So you know, it was sort of a very chilling thing that happened in the industry is that even though everyone did everything right, theoretically, they still ended up paying a big chunk of money to make the problem go away, which started making everyone wonder, do I really want to like plan everything down to that last inch if I can't really count on the whole team doing it? But you're going to get to, that's part of the whole thing of uh, really why an integrated project delivery team where you're all working together and have an established relationship where, where that becomes so important. Because doing this kind of really down to the inch planning on a traditional kind of design bid, build sort of system, yeah, you don't have the relationships in place to really make sure it all happens. So yeah, brief aside into actually one of the more interesting things that's coming out of all this because we can coordinate to the nth degree but really, whether or not we're ready as a, a business or as a, a process to do that is another <laughs> issue that's kind of still up in the air. Yes, Luis. Just to add about the three. Yes. And you had a really good issue there in general about the level of complexity we should include in the model. That, that is, again, it's one of these funny sliding scales, and there's no right answer about how complex it needs to be. You know, we used to do this thing, you know, we, we don't model the door handles. We don't model the hangers in the closet. We don't model, there's a lot of things we don't model, Yeah, you know, just because it's almost wasteful relative to what needs to be done. But that where that boundary is between what you need to specify and what can actually be assumed to happen reasonably in the field, it's kind of a funny sliding s you know, scale, and there's no right answer to it. But it, it is, in the world of modeling, one of the most interesting issues right now, because as we keep on, especially if I, as an architect, go ahead and share a model with you as the contractor go ahead and bid on, if I don't include every last door handle, you know, and you bid on putting one door handle in the whole project, whose responsibility is that at the end? Yeah, so you almost have to be very explicit about what you didn't include to make sure that yeah, it's, it's hard to share. It really is hard to share because what I did it for for my intent and what you're going to do it for your intent may be different. So whatever. That's just getting you thinking ahead because that's, that's, that's stuff you'll continue to hit through the year. Okay, let's take our break now.